I think the wisest strategy is you make your financial goal, then you make your artistic goal, and then you make it so that your financial goals、um, allow you to pursue exactly what you want to pursue for your interests, with literally zero regard for if anybody is going to collect it or not. Welcome to the Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors the bold. Brush. My name is Laura Ringelbeer, and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips, specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the art world, in order to hear their advice and insights. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few announcements. The first announcement is that we will be doing a two-week season break, and we'll be returning with more episodes on October twenty-fourth. The second announcement is that you can now watch the majority of our podcast episodes on our YouTube channel, where you can find us using our handle at BoldBrushArt. And of course, if you want to watch the episodes as soon as they're out and also get some excellent art marketing advice, then go check out BoldBrushShow.com. Now on with today's episode. On this episode, we sat down with Pavel Sokov, a Russian-born Canadian artist with a passion for science and culture. We discussed his incredible project documenting the daily lives of some of the tribes of Ethiopia. Why he began this project, the interesting cultural differences between the West and the tribes, and finally, we discuss some great advice for anyone seeking to selfishly paint what they want and also make a living from their work. Hello, Pavel, and welcome to the Bold Brush Show. How are you today? Hey, Laura or Laura. <laughs> I'm doing great today. How are you? Really happy to be here. I'm good. Yeah, I'm excited、uh, to talk to you because you you seem to have. A knack for doing a lot of cultural projects, which is something that is, in my opinion, not very common today. You would see it maybe in like the academic times or like in the times where there were more people who were actually out there documenting, of course, because there were no cameras.、Um, so what you're doing right now is pretty unique,、um, especially your current project, which will be what we will be discussing on the episode. But before we talk about that, I would like for you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, I'm Pavel, and I'm known for, I'd say, a couple things.、Um, primarily, it's my portrait commissions that I do for members of royal families and entrepreneurs and、uh, people like that.、Uh, but what I'm most excited about is my travel paintings. So I started a series called、uh, Stories of the World, which came about through me traveling all over the place as I like to do and being very interested in how other people live. And finding that people from、um, cultures that are not like my own, which is I'm Canadian and from Russia,、um, other people are very interesting to me. How they dress, their traditions, and I couldn't help but be drawn to painting them much more so than the regular kind of modern Western person.、Um, I guess in many ways、uh, I'm kind of replicating what the Orientalist painters did, kind of like you mentioned before.、Um, and yeah, I just want to travel all over the world, go to places that the most people don't go, and、uh, see people that most people don't interact with, and take down their stories and paint them.、Um, I've done India, Morocco, all over Asia, Japan. And right now, I'm really focused on doing the tribes of Ethiopia. That's awesome. Yeah, and、uh, I think that project is really fascinating too because、um, I feel like a lot of those those cultures that you've been, you know, painting and and visiting and seeing, so many of those because of you know things like globalization and、uh, travel and all these things, it's very easy for those cultures to be lost. So I think it's wonderful that you're capturing them in. A very one-on-one -on -one way versus a camera, which a camera can sometimes be,、um, it can have a different effect than actually being immersed. Which is really awesome that you actually immerse yourself to an extent.、Um, well, I still use the camera when I'm there.、Uh, so、uh, there's sometimes live paintings, but most of the situations,、um, I like to tell stories of different ceremonies and things that people do. Which unfortunately, or fortunately, or neutrally, means that、uh, a camera is very helpful because, let's say, I want to capture a rain dance in Ethiopia, or in India, I was at the Kumela festival, 
which is a religious gathering. It's actually the gathering of the most humans in one place ever. There was 190 million visitors, not on one day, but over the course of the month or so. It's once every 12 years. Um, and it's just a sea of people. And if I want to tell a story of how that looks or how that feels, uh, you're going to have to do it with cameras. But then if you have an opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one painting and the person has time and you can talk with them about giving you a sitting, that's fantastic. And then you can combine both live paintings and photo paintings. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But you do have to show up to the place. That I agree. Um, painting somebody else's photos from Google is, I mean, people can do what they want to do, but that doesn't interest me. I want to go to the actual place, find out what the, the people are about, and get a sense for the place. I think it helps the art, and I'm just genuinely interested uh, to be in these places myself uh, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, why did you specifically become interested in the tribes of Ethiopia? Well, I'd say the way it happened is that um, I developed a friendship with my favorite photographer in the world, uh, Leif Steiner. Mm -hmm. um, he is big on photographing different indigenous people and, and uh, tribal people or people that aren't part of our grand society. Um, he loved my art. I loved his photos. And over a couple of years, I was saying that we should go on a trip together and uh, make some artworks together. And then finally, sometime after uh, COVID, uh, he started setting up uh, trips to Ethiopia because he's working on a photo book of uh, Ethiopian tribes of the Omo Valley. So he invited me and I said, let's go. And then when I got there, I realized that uh, this is something I want to do multiple times. I'm actually coming back this January for another month. Oh. So I think I'll spend about five years probably uh, painting just the Omo Valley Ethiopia tribes. Not just, I mean, I'm going to paint other stuff that I visit because mm -hmm. I'm going to keep visiting things nonstop. But over the course of five years, I'll deliver quite a lot of uh, paintings. So it's not that I sought out the tribes of you know, very open-minded. You tell me, let, let's go to uh, Mongolian eagle hunters. Okay, let's go. Let's go to the Myanmar long neck tribe. Let's go. I want to go to Chernobyl, but that's a little bit not going to happen at the moment. <laughs> and for the next few moments, uh, and I missed my chance. I actually had um, a tour booked in uh, early 2020, and then the pandemic hit and it got canceled. Yeah. Um, and I had another one booked in uh, 2014, <laughs> right before uh, Russia invaded again. Oh, yeah. So uh, it was twice I tried to go and my uh, plans were uh, destroyed. So, um, so I don't necessarily get stuck on who is it that I'm interested in everybody and anybody that doesn't look like this, you know? Mm -hmm um don't care i'll go to another planet uh happily like it doesn't so i don't seek things out i just go to where is whatever is happening I'm, I'm there you know yeah i love that that's very much like go with the flow seize the day type of uh you know let's explore the earth because it's wild and interesting and um there's so much more out there than than just you know everything living is in interesting this one place. yeah yeah, I, I even, um, I want to go to North Korea also. Mm, um, good luck with I'm that. I'm thinking about doing that. <laughs> Nobody really wants to go with me for some reason. But... Oh, really? <laughs> Nobody wanted to go to Chernobyl with me either. I don't know. People are weird. <laughs> I, I might want to go to Chernobyl. You know, if you ever need a buddy, maybe I'll go. I would definitely take a ton of iodine pills, though. <laughs> Oh, it's Where fine. Like You'll get more radiation <laughs> on the plane there and on the x-rays That's there, true. to be honest. Um, That's true. Look, you're there for a few days. It's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> so hopefully, if there's ever an opportunity, I'll be there. I want to do plein air painting because I've never seen a plein air painting That's um, true. done yeah. in uh, Pripyat. So that's my goal. 
but oh, wow. life is conspiring uh, against this goal. Well, you know, maybe it's just not time yet. You know, you just gotta gotta wait a little more. Um, but it would be I'll cool to even see better some plein air by then. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe it's because of that. I mean, like, I would love to see a plein air of like, you know, the the playgrounds and like the empty apartments and all that because that's it's so spooky. Um, but it's wildly interesting, just like being in in a place that had, that saw god so much change overnight um yeah. but continuing with uh, the ethiopian tribes um i'm i'm very curious um why so ethiopia has 80 tribes in total is what i is what i was researching before talking to you um but you're focusing just on the ones of these this valley and i'm guessing i mean from what i read they have so much diversity even you know within these tribes like every tribe is totally different some of them have scarification to beautify their bodies others wear the the lip things others you know they do a lot of different rituals um was there a specific one that you found the most interesting or that you really really wanted to document they are all different uh, they have a few things in common but each one has their own kind of unique flavor and what's also interesting is when you meet each tribe um you get to encounter a different personality like different approach that they have uh, towards you mm -hmm. which my guess that it depended on the level of hardship or danger or lack thereof that they experience and also how many uh tourists if any they've met because uh, some a couple of tribes that we visited they've never seen anything like that Wow. Um, so their level of friendliness was quite different between each tribe. I found that very interesting. Um, I still kept uh, the empty-headed, open-minded approach where whatever tribe you put in front of me, I'm interested. I didn't pick any tribe over another. It's just um, we visited those six. And in mm -hmm. January, there's actually going to be an opportunity to visit three new ones that I have not. Bodhi Karo tribe, uh, the Bodhi tribe, and the third one that they just got a road built that will give access for the first time wow. to them. So I don't really know what they look like. And I don't even uh, check before I go. I, I like to show up and see for myself, kind of mimicking maybe how the Orientalists would have uh, felt. Mm. Exactly. So on my first trip to Ethiopia, I actually made a point not to learn anything about anything. Um, I just Googled the war they had going on a bit because my parents were yeah. complaining about it. Um, yeah. But uh, other than that, I wanted to have a fresh meeting with them. Um, but if you ask me, now that I've seen those six tribes where there's some that are more or less interesting. I would say that the ones that experience more uh, tourism and visitors are less interesting on average than the ones that have not. So an example of a tribe that gets a lot of visitors is the Suri tribe. Um, I think the reason why is because they're surrounded by very beautiful, lush land and they're... Um, somewhat near the city of Jinka if you drive for like eight hours um <laughs> and I think tourists are most likely to go there and they also um are one of the two tribes we've encountered that wear those uh, quintessential lip rings oh yeah um and the result of them having encountered a lot of tourists is that they change uh the way that they beautify themselves in order to uh, increase the chance of um, a tourist uh, person to uh, book a photo shoot with them because um, each time you sit down for a life painting or a photo shoot it's um, your guide makes an arrangement with the tribal chief and name names get taken down for every photo shoot or life pose or everything and everybody actually gets paid so it's a commercial enterprise yeah. And um, unfortunately, if you have a lot of visitors, that means that people are starting to put like dried fruits in, on their head and different leaves and things. 
because it attracts uh, the photographer and they're starting to do a bit of marketing, you know? <laughs> and my philosophy for these paintings are not to make the most interesting painting. I don't think about that. Mm -hmm. Or at least if you consider what I consider to be true, that the most interesting painting is the painting that shows you exactly how the things actually are, is what I consider interesting. Um, so I endeavor to find people that um, look like how they always look and do the things they always do and don't set up an attractive situation um, to, to capture me as a photographer. So um, the Suri tribe was a little bit uh, big on, on those marketing moves, <laughs> yeah. which I don't blame them. Good for them. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I often had to adjust like take things that they're put on their head and ask them to take it off and kind of put them back into how I think they looked yesterday before we <laughs> showed up type of thing yeah uh so yeah yeah no and it's you know it, it is good for them I mean I'm sure it, it benefits them a lot but at the same time you know it, it feels less authentic which of course you're seeking out the authentic when you're visiting these tribes well that's another reason why I find it important my my whole series of doing these uh, world paintings is that uh, every single person that you see me painting this traditional uh, people, their way of life will disappear soon and quickly and is disappearing at high speeds right now. Uh, my friend Leaf, the photographer, he says, even this time we visited in November of uh, last year, he said he started visiting in about 2019 or so or maybe the first time was 2018 and just in, when he first went there nobody had any western shorts or uh, like louis vuitton and prada shirts that mm -hmm. <laughs> they print out somewhere um and as time goes on like a serious like 30 percent of people were wearing like uh football jerseys yeah. and a lot of louis vuitton supreme <laughs> uh knockoff <laughs> shirts um yeah. and yeah they're comfy i guess and uh, that's gonna happen and i'm not there to stop them but what i am there for is while we still have the real outfits i gotta go paint that real quick over the next few years because i honestly don't think that's gonna last long like mm -hmm. i was watching um a video there's a tribe on the border of northern india and myanmar called mm -hmm. the headhunters tribe and um, they tattooed their face and uh, they used to hunt other tribes and kill each other. And then they would um, preserve their heads and make these metal head necklaces uh, mm -hmm. that would uh, signify how many people they've killed. Wow. And uh, they're not doing that anymore. And that's probably good. Uh, <laughs> So the only people that have done that are now these uh, village elders that are like 80 years old. So um, these traditions, for better or for worse, I'm not even commenting whether it's for better or for worse. It's probably for the better, to be honest. Uh, what I am saying is that these traditions are factually going to be gone. Man, honestly, in the next like five years, like half of them are going to be gone. Yeah, Time is running out fast. If you're talking about 20, 30 years from now, like Mongolian eagle hunters, no way. Like, And why is that? That's because um, tourists come and they um, set up photo shoots with them and they kind of introduce their way of life and their various comforts to a tribe, which the tribe obviously wants to adopt for their own betterment and their mm -hmm. own comfort so naturally these things are um, gonna go fast so i just want to preserve a snapshot of what once was uh, yeah. not as a comment that i don't necessarily find it wrong or sad i have no valuation on what is happening i'm not here to judge that uh, it's just I find how people look right now super interesting and I know that in about 20 30 years we're all going to look the same so for me my interest in painting 
will be hindered by that a lot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, it is, yeah, it's it's an unfortunate reality, um, fortunate or unfortunate, as you said, actually, that, you know, things are changing. Um, it's inevitable, of course. Uh, that's evolution. I mean, it's part of life. It's adapt or perish, basically. So... Well, it globalization, is it is. which I like, and uh, I, I like when cultures interact with each other, like uh, Koreans uh, are exporting their culture a lot uh, lately, mm -hmm. and that's pretty cool. I'm happy to see that. And um, yeah, there's some great things about it. It's just there's a couple sad things about it. Mm -hmm. Even in Morocco, when I visited, I could only find, I think, three people total in two weeks that weren't wearing an adidas track suit or something um oh and i painted one he was a merchant his name is rashid and he's in the city of fez i hope he's mm -hmm. still there and he dressed in a very interesting traditional way and um he was the cause of i think my first travel uh, painting of a traditional looking person wow. um so even right now uh people are globalizing and uh it's it's even hard to find people like that even today very true i mean you know it's like when you look at the the folk clothing even of western countries and people in western europe and in eastern europe you see it less and less definitely in the newer generations um and you do still have to like dig up a picture so it's good to in the present find the places where those folk traditions are still being practiced um, because eventually they'll just, like you said, end up, you know, in a picture or in an old painting. Um, but specifically also, I was very curious to know, you know, what was there like, were there any cultural differences during your time with the tribes that maybe also made you want to paint a specific subject pertaining to that tribe? <laughs> oh, there's very many uh, cultural uh, differences and there is some... Um so many things that the tribes do that i guess western people would find uh fairly questionable i myself don't it's uh, people can do whatever they want to do i'm a libertarian uh and uh whatever they're into is, is completely fine by me um they had a uh, culture of revenge murders for example huh. uh, and they have a whole system set up for how to go about a revenge murder, which is complete with rules about how you can stop the cycle of revenge by going to the village elder, and he will broker a deal with the victim's uh, family. And uh, if the deal is accepted, then uh, the victim will wash themselves in goat blood, which will signify that they promise to not exact revenge. But if such a deal does not come through, even 20, 30 years later, that person uh, has the right to kill uh, in revenge the other person, which is something that happened when uh, the night we arrived to the Mercy tribe, somebody got um, killed there. And the cause of it was 20 years old. So the person's father was killed uh, by that man so he he took uh and then uh the killer did not go to the village elder to create a deal for some reason and this caused uh 20 years later he paid for it um so there's traditions like that there's a lot of ritualistic scarification um which is uh, seen as beautification rather than scarification i would say it's mm -hmm. um I would liken it to uh, their form of tattoos. It's like if we started calling tattoos uh, some self-mutilation or something, uh, we would find that to be unreasonable. So I think the same for them and their scarification. Um, so when I see traditions like that, I really want to capture that event or tell the story about it. So my goal for the next trip in January is to have more scenes of people engaging in these ceremonies. Like, I want to capture a cattle jumping ceremony, which is when uh, a boy comes of age, 
because a lot of cultures, traditional cultures, have a coming of age um, ritual. Um, even if, let's say, in the Jewish culture, bar mitzvah is uh, a version of a coming to age. Um, but in a lot of uh, African cultures, there is a challenge involved where the boy has to actually complete uh, a challenge to earn uh, his adulthood. And in this case, they line up the family's cattle in a line. And uh, the boy has to um, jump over top of them and run across them without falling. Um, and at the same time, uh, his sisters, if he has any, or the women in his family, to show um, the respect and loyalty to the tribe and to him and to celebrate his manhood, what they do is um, they self-whip their back. Mm -hmm. um, I saw this a lot in the Hummer tribe, particularly, because I can't say that every tribe has the, the exact same. There's a lot of cattle jumping in a lot of different tribes, but they might have different variations. But I can tell you that in the Hammer tribe, the women of the family will whip themselves to create a scar. And the bigger and cooler the scar is, the more elegant she is and the more respect you see towards her later. And uh, when you see her, she gains uh, kind of status and respect that this is a elegant lady uh, because she showed her loyalty to her family and her tribe with these uh, scars that she put on her back. Um, so things like that, I want to capture and paint those. Um, I saw an interesting ceremony. I have uh, photos and I plan a painting of um, before a harvesting season in the Mercy tribe. The, uh, they selected two boys to drink warm blood from a cow which I was afraid um, was going to die because I have very many problems watching animals get hurt. Yeah. So it was uh, tough for me. I had to see a lot of that uh, during my month. Uh, but that's their life. That's what they do. And it's not for me to say. So they um, took a cow and they caught a vein and it started squirting warm blood. And these two boys, they captured it in a wooden um, canister and then they drank the warm blood to give them strength uh, for the harvesting season because they're going to work a lot uh, to harvest uh, some grains, which is uh, mostly maize. Um, and luckily for me, I was pleasantly surprised. The cow, after they were done the bloodletting, and I should have logic this out, was not going to die because that would be an extremely expensive uh, endeavor that would be not mm -hmm. worth it so what they did is they took cow dung and they just glued the wound shut and the cow just walked away like nothing happened and uh, I was very happy to see that yeah um, and that, that makes a lot of sense because you have to remember that in the tribes um, their wealth and their life is mostly in their uh, cows and their goats and their cattle so that's not only their wealth, it's also their security. It's their, it's what makes the things that they eat or consume. And it's very important to them. So obviously they weren't going to let a cow die just for that. Yeah. Like you said, that would be very uh, expensive for them to lose a cow. Um, it's a very important creature. Yeah. Um, so they yeah, don't eat... Is... Um, they don't really eat uh, animals. They, uh, they're they mostly vegetarians. Um, they'll, they'll eat a goat for a ceremony or uh, some sort of very, very special occasion. Um, but for them, it's like, it's like their real estate, you know, you wouldn't want to chip uh, your garage off your house, you know? Yeah, so it happens extremely rarely. And I didn't see anybody eat any meat in my month uh, mm -hmm. there. That's fascinating. I mean, yeah. it definitely goes to show that um, the way they live is is just something totally different than what we would expect. Um, and they definitely live off the land, which also has its own rules and its own, like how you said, they have a harvesting season and they have to focus on when to plant and when to pick so that they know that next season they will have, or next year, they'll have enough food. 
which uh, of course with our uh, say like first world place, it's just, uh, you just go to a supermarket, which is a totally different experience. So I can imagine being a month there for you must have been almost like going back in time, you know, to like when humans were still trying to live from the land and uh, basically existing uh, and taking care of themselves in a totally different way that, you know, today we become so, uh, so used to convenience, you know, um, which is so fascinating. Well, you make a great point that that exact aspect is, I think, the most interesting thing about the Ethiopian tribes in particular is because um, actually human genealogy traces back exactly to Ethiopia, mm -hmm. where uh, the fr the oldest uh, hum humanoid fossils, not even human, but humanoid, uh, the previous versions were found in Ethiopia. You can see the skeleton uh, of Lucy. Yeah. Um, it's one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, excavated fossil in a museum in Addis Ababa. So when you say that, it's it's very on point because that's actually where humans evolved from. And um, seeing these cultures is a bit of a time machine mixed with some modern things like um, uh, the tribal chiefs, they do have a cell phone because uh, sometimes they need to call the government for help uh, on something. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of AK for a lot of guns. Obviously, there wasn't guns uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of those now, which they never keep on safety. And they're just in all oh. states of disrepair. Oh, uh, <laughs> and they fire them off sometimes. Um, in the Hammer tribe, if somebody passes away, um, they let uh, the surrounding villages know by firing into the air. So, so that is wow. a somber moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is very interesting to kind of see how people live right now, which you can assume is similar to how people lived a long, long time ago. And you can kind of see a stage in human evolution that explains um, how we got to where we are with our credit cards and iPhones. Um, and I find that very interesting. And you even get to see tribal psychology and compare it to modern day tribal psychology and see the ways that we have changed and many ways in which we have not and many ways in which we still have similar psychologies but on a grander scale really mm. um i find that very interesting yeah yeah i mean i feel like we probably haven't changed too much in that sense you know um there's still like, are you an Android person or an iPhone person type of uh, <laughs> world, um, which is, it's very interesting because that it creates like a similar sort of dichotomy that I could imagine seeing in different tribes as well. Um, it, it sounds a little funny, but the mentality is still there, you know? Oh, exactly. Like you talk to a tribe, uh, we talked to the Nyangatom uh, tribe on the border of South Sudan in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and they were one of the less friendly tribes. And I think it's because their environment is super dry and it's just all messed up. Like even their animals would come back to the village. There was a donkey whose um, ass was completely chewed off by somebody, maybe a hyena. And this donkey came back home to the village and his ass was just gone. And I was just like, oh, no. oh my God, oh, somebody help that donkey. Holy crap. Yeah. But they had uh, this attitude of like, yeah, that donkey's gone, I guess. And there was no emotion, like no. Because I was like, oh my God, somebody do something. And they were just like, it is what it is, man. <laughs> yeah. Like in the Rocky, you know, if, if he dies, he dies. <laughs> and uh, Yeah. So that rough lifestyle uh, is also partly due because their village gets attacked a lot, mm -hmm. which uh, causes them to build these fences around their village, which you actually see in one of my paintings that just came back from a show that I kind of now wish I brought into this room to show you, but didn't think of that. Uh, it's called Atuba, Tribeswoman Atuba Building a Fence. And she's uh, chopping uh, wood to build a fence around the village because they get attacked a lot uh, by animals, but also by other tribes. 
And when you talk to them about the attacks, uh, it's just like it's always been with humans. You know, it's like we never attack first. Uh, we'll only attack in revenge because they took our cattle. Then obviously, if you go to that tribe and they, they never attack first, either. nobody attacks first ever. <laughs> Everybody's always defending. Yeah. Uh, wow. And uh, nothing, nothing has uh, changed uh, which was evidence, particularly to me last year, that uh, everybody always says uh, that they're uh, attacking for all the right reasons, but as always, so not much has <laughs> changed. Yeah, that is so fascinating. At Bold Brush, we inspire artists to inspire the world because creating art creates magic, and the world is currently in desperate need of magic. Boldbrush provides artists with free art marketing, creativity, and business ideas and information. This show is an example. We also offer written resources, articles, and a free monthly art contest open to all visual artists. We believe that fortune favors the bold brush. And if you believe that too, sign up completely free at boldbrushshow.com. That's B-O-L-D-B-R-U-S-H show.com. The Bold Brush Show is sponsored by Faso. Now more than ever, it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist, especially if you want to be a professional in your career. Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start now by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. Because um, it's like the same, but obviously a little different. I mean, their lives are actually at risk compared to, you know, the average person in the West. Um, so that's, that must, yeah, I can understand why they would, you know, become more numb or more resist, resilient against, you know, loss, um, since it's such a natural part of their life at that point. Um, so fascinating. And then, you know, I was curious since you mentioned a specific painting. Is there any other painting that you created um, that you hold maybe closest to or the painting that you maybe feel more attached to that you created, um, you know, making, you know, that shows one of these tribes? Well, right now it's uh, the one in the back of me right there. Mm. Nice. So this guy, he's from the here i'll uh yeah show you. he's from the arbori tribe which was one of my favorite tribes um because they were a very, very interesting mixture of not having received any tourists uh except uh, my photographer friend a few times wow. and they always remember every tribe we go to they meet so few people that when we come back you just hear uh, kids running at the car screaming, leaf, 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 which Aww. is the, the name of uh, the photographer friend. Yeah. And uh, he jumps out. They're all like, leaf, leaf, leaf. And they gather around us screaming, leaf. It's Aww. very cute. It is. Uh, yeah, the kids uh, are super cute. Mm -hmm. um, so this tribe was super friendly and uh, smiling and laughing and uh they even had a couple guys uh, dressing super stylish with a hat and a feather, and they're like leaning against a tree, all cool. Uh, they're the they're uh, fashion influencers, I, I suppose. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So I love the uh, these guys because they still all the traditional stuff is there, but so friendly and easygoing and. Uh, hanging out at our uh, tent camp and they're just a lot of fun and I loved uh, chasing the kids mm -hmm. I found a new form of exercise because there's no gyms so yeah. um the kids they're obsessed with stealing your plastic uh, water bottle um 
I guess because it allows them to carry water uh, mm -hmm. or something like that. But it's not good to give it to them because it just ends up on the ground, a uh, hundred percent chance of it ending up on the ground very soon after and cluttering up the place. So after every time we left the camp, we would go around collecting uh, some plastic trash because the tribes people don't currently have any desire to not have the, the little bits of trash around. Um, so these kids, they want your water bottle. So I found a great way to exercise by having them chase me for the water bottle. And I thought Oh, nice. that since I'm so much older that I would actually win and they're, they wouldn't get the water bottle. And there was like th 30 of them or so. And they ran so fast. The water bottle was gone from my hands in like five minutes at most. between three to five minutes i tried three times i lost three water bottles <laughs> That's yeah such a great so story, though. Mm -hmm. uh yeah i just had a good i guess emotional experience uh, with that tribe and this painting i'm a big fan of it i think it's it's possibly the best painting i've done but probably easier to say the top three because sometimes when you finish a painting that you're happy about you're a bit too uh, excited about
I'm very happy to show this interaction of the environment in person in this painting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, it's an incredible painting. I love it. I was actually Oh, thank staring you. at it <laughs> almost like way before you even mentioned it because it's so, it's so, uh, it is very reminiscent of, you know, those people in, in the academic world from before the camera who, you know, would go out and, you know, also document the same thing. So to me, it's like I'm looking at the past, but it's actually the present, um, which is, it's so wonderful because it brings that timelessness into the work. Um I can't see Yeah, the details, I want to. but it's it's lovely. Oh yeah, you can see them on Instagram or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to with my paintings. I would ideally like to transport you there, like you're there with me, uh, but you don't have to, you know, take the flight and spend all that money and get sick uh, like I did. But I'd like you to get a bit of the experience of actually being there and. maybe get a feel for the weather and what kind of air they have, which is the mountains, they often uh, tell the story of what kind of air is in an environment. Like for example, Colorado is famous for having very little atmospheric perspective. Even John Singer Sargent commented on how difficult it is to paint Colorado because it doesn't have that Um, distance that uh, oxygen often creates Yeah. so with, with my painting it gives you this like sandy warm feeling that I hope transports you to the place and gives you a little bit of that physical experience maybe you can even imagine some smells like I painted a couple of pieces of uh, cattle dung for Oh, lovely. <laughs> To, to add to your experience, <laughs> uh, yeah. things like that are important. So like I said before, I'm not trying to make a beautiful painting. I'm trying to, uh, my goal is a little bit different. So I'm not uh, taking out the cattle dung. I'm, I'm happy that it's there, you know? Yes, because it's part of the environment. Um, and it's it's Oh, wonderful it, it, to include I can it. probably see what it is. It's Yeah, very, <laughs> in I fact, can imagine. it's so much part of the environment that I got a lung infection and was uh, a bit worried that, for my life there so <laughs> there's definitely Oh my cattle god. dung i can promise you that Yes. Yeah. Um and it does have a particular smell. Uh I mean I live uh I live on an island in the north and uh sometimes like when you're driving, you know, from one of the next nearby islands and you're driving back, especially in the summer, you you get that smell of the cattle poops. Um <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah even through your air conditioning. So it's a very ooh, it's a very strong smell. I'm glad you survived. Um <laughs> Yeah. So I also wanted to know, you know, because you've had time to actually be with these tribes and um, and to experience them, do you feel like it also has changed the way that you view painting and how you try to um, capture the tribes as well? I think what I would say in terms of painting is that it gave me a bit of um, purpose and a reason for the paintings that, okay, I'm a strange uh, artist. This is going to be highly unpopular, highly unlikable. I understand, but too bad. I, I just... Not going to lie, I don't think artists are the most useful parts of society. That's just my opinion, because that's what I think. Sorry. Uh, I don't think that our paintings uh, do much. We can't eat them. We can't drive them. We can't type on them. Um, and I find uh, us and our way of life to be quite uh, kind of selfish and self-absorbed in that We do things that pleasure us all day by painting. Like, why do I paint? Not to please you guys, to please me. <laughs> so, uh, and there's something about that that makes me sad a bit where I was thinking that if I was bitten by a different bug, I could have been a scientist, uh, maybe do something actually useful. Uh, and I, everybody disagrees with me on this. When I, when I, do my spiel on how I think artists are kind of like some of the most useless people <laughs> possible. Uh, everybody's was like, no, no, it's so useful. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, and I get what, I get what people are saying in a way. And I think 
when I do something like uh, paint people whose way of life will disappear uh, fairly soon, I do kind of see that there is a point. Because when I look back at the Orientalist painters, even though they painted most of those paintings back in their studios in Paris or uh, London, perhaps, but mostly Paris, um, I hope that their setups that they created in Paris uh, are meant to actually mimic what they saw, which is what I'm doing with my paintings. I'm not, like I said, I'm not a beautifier. I don't care about beautiful things. I care about how it is. Mm -hmm. um, so it is my hope that the Orientalist paintings are historical glimpses into a world that's now long gone. And it gives us a piece of history that we can't see or experience any other way. And I think there is a lot of value in that. Um, for example, there is uh, a famous, the most famous tribal photographer. I forget his name and probably shouldn't mention his name anyway, but he is the McDonald's of tribal photography in that he shows up and he'll hire people from his uh, cruise ship to go pretend to be tribes uh, and he'll dress them up in costumes and he'll shoot a smoke machine behind them. And you see his photos and they're epic. They're like cinematic, like movie scene photos. But people that know him and have met him, 80% of the time, that's like his like Uber driver or something or his hotel staff. And he's not sleeping in the tent with the, the tribes. He's sleeping at the hotel. <laughs> uh and he makes epic imagery, but he has a different goal. His goal is be very famous at tribal photography yeah. and give you a beautiful, exciting image. Yeah. And good for him. I'm not necessarily going to poo on his parade, but I find there to be some sort of anthropological value in uh, the paintings the way I do them that I never beautify a scene i don't romanticize anybody or anything and i don't bring my like western opinions into anything like people are revenge killing people uh, men are marrying uh, many wives although that's not a <laughs> that's not so difficult for me to, <laughs> to bridge yeah. that gap but there's things like um scarification and like women beating themselves that are a bit difficult on my opinions but i don't uh, i will paint whatever is happening and the things i saw and my approach to them made me feel like there is an actual value uh, to creating these artworks. Besides the enjoyment of your eyes, uh, there is an anthropological, historical, psychological, cultural value to preserving these moments. So yeah. th that's kind of what it gave me, I would say. Wow. And you know what? You mentioned something there that I find, uh, I find very key. And that is, um, you know, comparing what you're doing to this other person who's basically just setting things up. It's fascinating to also see how your, your goal, right, can determine so much of the process as well as the end result of what you're creating, um, which is something that I think every artist should be asking themselves when they're creating an image. It's like, what am I trying to do? You know, like, why? Yeah, yeah exactly, I, because... Yeah. When you make a goal to, let's say, sell, uh, I want to sell paintings and uh, get the money and have the money. That's a goal, right? Yep. Or you could set a different goal of making the most authentic painting that you can. And unfortunately, those two goals are counterproductive to each other. And um, I can tell you that uh, so far, I've started my Ethiopian project and I cannot say that uh, like people uh, nobody's ever told me that they want to hang paintings of uh, tribes people in their home I've nobody's that's not the reason why I got into this nobody ever told me that the 
the popular thing to do is to paint uh, these traditional cultures. In fact, it's highly unpopular. What you are supposed to paint is uh, naked women and uh, flowers and landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to make a choice as an artist. Uh, what are you doing and why? Yeah. And I've made my choice here, so I'm going to maximize the reason for that choice, which is not to create sellable artwork that everybody's going to break down my door to, to go acquire. But if somebody cares about the most authentic, real representation of a rare culture, then I will be that person that you go to and you will pay a lot of money. And that's how it has to be. Um, and if not, that's okay. I don't need you to. So we'll be all right either way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good perspective to have too. Um, because, you know, I had a, a teacher at, at Angel Academy, Michael John Angel. He actually used to say, you know, if you want to be rich, uh, if you're trying to paint for the money, uh, maybe you should pick another career. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying that. Uh, no, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but he meant it as like... Just if the goal is just money and uh and it's not the creation of anything beautiful then painting is not yeah. the way to go because it's very much about the self and about you know putting the work before the money and then the money comes you know exactly i just don't want people to feel like um the path of an artist is not financially lucrative oh, no, i guess no, after no. what i said it sounds like uh, that might be what i was getting at but <laughs> Absolutely not. So I have different goals for different things. Mm -hmm. um, like behind me is a painting I'm working on that's going to end up with the king of Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't you worry about my finances. They're, oh, no. <laughs> they're plenty, <laughs> plenty fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they call us starving artists, but uh, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, I um, feel like that's that's a lie. Um, like, I mean, it is always possible to make money. Of course. The issue is, you know, if you're putting the money before the creation of something that's meaningful to you, then of course you're going to suffer and you might as well just do something else um, because then you're just sacrificing um, time and energy into something that maybe, you know, you could be making more money doing something else versus if you're doing something that comes from within you that, you know, you're you really want to, like you, for example, you really want to capture all these beautiful cultures or um, you're being asked to paint these amazing portraits that you enjoy. That's, God, that's like winning the lottery, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, for commissioned portraits, you got to find a balance. I'm lucky where I kind of navigated my commissioned portraits towards an area that overlaps with my interest in traditional cultures. Mm -hmm. So... I get to do a lot of portraits for royal families that want to preserve their history. So I'm getting these old uh, historical black and white photographs wow. um, of situations that are long gone. And it's once again, it evokes the Orientalist uh, painter situation. Um, so I try to take on, uh, I try to make my stories of the world collection, encourage people to contact me for this type of project so that I can have uh, an equal blast painting the commission as I do my studio work. But then again, uh, look, I'm heading to Dubai in a few weeks and I got uh, two commissions to paint there. Mm -hmm. And neither, neither of them are traditional culture uh, portraits. They're um, portraits of uh, modern successful people. One is a real estate developer Another one is a successful guy's wife and daughter. So these are not things that excite me emotionally, uh, but they excite me financially. So yeah. <laughs> um, what I like to do is um, I set a financial goal and then I set an artistic goal and I try to maximize where they can cross over. But if I have an artistic goal, which is, I'm just obsessed with showing you traditional cultures and people don't care too much for that. I will not stop. The, I refuse. It, I don't care if you guys buy it or not. Uh, a lot of people do. Most people don't. Most people are buying landscapes and nude women. Um, I will not stop no matter what. Why? 
because I got lots of money from another area, which allows me to do whatever I want and not uh, try to be popular and not uh, go start a TikTok and start dancing on it or turning around with my uh, canvas or whatever is the, the latest. Yeah. Uh, Gimmick. Uh, yeah. So I think the wisest strategy is you make your financial goal, then you make your artistic goal, and then you make it so that your financial goals um, allow you to pursue exactly what you want to pursue for your interests with literally zero regard for if anybody is going to collect it or not. Yeah, that is, wow. That is really excellent advice because I feel like um, it can be so easy to, to fall into the trap of like, I have to make it with my paintings that I love. And then it creates this sort of like pressure that just maybe makes the work a little less um god it, it just makes it lose some of that beauty because you're so pressured that you can't fully focus on creating a beautiful image because you get that inner critic or, or all those voices that say like oh how is this going to sell who's going to give a damn and if you you know do as you do where you don't you really don't give a damn because you're fine you have something else supplementing you that frees you up to do whatever the hell you want which is excellent <laughs> and i believe that when a person continues to do exactly what they want to do at a high level with passion and continue to just hammer on it. Um, like I recognize now that, uh, for example, galleries aren't exactly going to cancel their next uh, Western cowboy uh, themed uh, show, which they know sells well in order to do a one man Ethiopia tribes show. Uh, that's not, they're not exactly dying to do that, but I'm going to keep hammering at this until you're basically forced to just comply with my interests. <laughs> uh, look, this uh, ends in one way only. I'm painting this until I die or until you become interested in what I'm interested in because I'm just refused to stop. <laughs> so, uh, and I think if you do that, I mean, how are new markets created is through passion and through just chipping and chipping and chipping at it and not changing yourself for the world, but making the world change to your preference, <laughs> which is obviously uh, pretty challenging. But I think I think we can do it. At least we're going to find out because that's what I plan to do. Well, yeah, we will see. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the story <laughs> remains to be told. I guess yes. we'll find out. Which is very exciting, too, and inspiring. It's like, you know, go for it. And then it also, you know, it inspires me to pursue the things that I love. Like, I watch you, you're doing, you know, these these amazing projects of, of different cultures and science. Um, and those are obviously your passions. So it, it definitely, I hope it would also inspire our listeners. But also, I can speak for myself and say damn, it makes me really want to go for the things that I give a damn about um, and then force people to <laughs> see things my way too. <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah, when you're so excited about something, uh, like I love uh, talking and making friends with non-artists. Uh, if they're passionate about what they're doing, I love hearing them talk about well, what they love, like particularly scientists. Uh, even like people in finance. Uh, I love hanging out with them. And just whatever you're excited about is just uh, can be infectious in a good way, I think. Or at least to me, I'm drawn to um, the passion and interest of other people in doing something productive and difficult. And people will, you can show people what is interesting about what you find interesting, you know, over time. Yeah. Uh, or in the very least, maybe it won't work, but you'll have a fun life and you'll be proud of the work uh, you made, even if people didn't get it and they decided to buy whatever's on TikTok these days or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like yeah. you said, what counts is uh, that, you know, in the end, this is a very selfish act. You know, what we create is literally for our own pleasure more than anything. Um, and that's what counts, yeah. you know, living life for yourself, um, just doing whatever, <laughs> which is nice. Um, yeah. Do you have any other pieces of advice that you'd like to share, you know, maybe for someone uh, who's just starting out with painting or, 
who wants to become an artist uh, who lives from their work? I think what I would say is um, one of the things that really helped me get my career going, like literally within six months of trying, um, it was uh, close to 10 years ago now that I started my career. I quit my uh, uh, business office job and uh, moved to California to learn oil painting. And uh, I got kind of going right away. And when I asked myself, why is that? Why was it fast? Um, it's a combination of a uh, luck, which you need. Um, but, you know, the the brave uh the brave are the ones that get lucky the most you know so uh Definitely. i found that i went after and took on um, different projects that at that time i was a little bit too uh green for i didn't quite know if i could execute this uh, this challenge I did my first oil painting commission during my first semester at Watts. A semester is three months there. So in my first three months of touching oil paint, I took on an oil painting commission. Um, it was from Reddit. I painted somebody's dog. Yeah, it's <laughs> humble <laughs> beginnings from uh, Reddit's dogs to uh, kings and things like that. But you have to start where you have to start. But what is really important is to say yes to uncomfortable things that are a bit too soon because I've seen other uh, students at the time take the seemingly more logical strategy of not putting the card in front of the horse so they would um, take things kind of slowly and logically in steps like they would take all drawing classes before doing uh, painting classes I for example skipped drawing classes and took painting classes right away <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and they would like build up to things and that's fine that will work but the brave thing to do is you don't build up to it you just do it right away you say yes to everything um and it's extremely stressful and you get like literally physically ill i remember one time magazine through sheer miracle and luck contacted me to do the time person of the year cover in 2014 it was my first six months of trying to be an artist wow. and uh, I said yes and I had like 40 hours of class each week and I had only two weeks to uh, to get it done um, and I remember when I realized that the email wasn't actually a scam because I was convinced that it was um, some sort of like phishing scam. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I realized it wasn't a scam, I just like turned green. And I, everyone's like, do you have a fever or something? Because I realized I'm like, I wanted it to be a scam, you know, so that I don't have to have the pressure and the pain of... Um... At the time, I felt a lot of stress because I feel a great responsibility upon myself. When somebody does a commission with me, it is extremely intrinsically required for me to make sure they're happy and not because I care about them or I'm a good guy. Absolutely not. And I'm not a good guy. I deeply want to be proud of myself as a person. Mm. And for that to happen, I needed to be true that working with me or doing something with me is something that every person will be happy and excited that they did and would never regret. And this is something I need that's so that when I go to bed, I can say that I respect myself, yeah. not the client. The, the, not the, the client is the client, but if uh, for me. So that pressure, when I would say to certain things early on, that personality uh, would put a lot of stress on me that actually I found made me learn faster, perform faster, and do leaps of artistic evolution um, very quickly because you gave your commitment and you'd rather die than break your commitment or not be able to do something that you told somebody that you're able to do. So your brain just unlocks whatever resources are there 
that are required to make this happen. And uh, I grew artistically very quickly through a lot of stress and through a lot of like hair falling out and stuff like that. Um, I remember going to paint an MIT professor from life at her like mansion early on. And um, it was so challenging. The light was going everywhere. Uh, the pose was all changing. It was, it was so stressful. Like I literally, my hair started falling out faster. But uh, through doing things like that, I literally feel nothing now. I feel absolutely nothing about anything. I have no stress. I don't know what, what kind of task they would have to give me for me to experience some sort of like fear or trepidation at this point. Hmm. And I think that was built through those early years of jumping into things uh, without the safety on, you know? Yep. Um, and the more stress and pain you feel, um, the better, I think. At least... Look, I can tell you that's how it was for me. We, I recognize we all have different brains and different psychologies and different things that push us. Maybe some people grow better from positive reinforcement, whereas I grow from negative reinforcement exclusively. Um, so take my advice with a grain of salt and I guess ask yourself if psychologically what is right for you. But I can tell you that for me, discomfort was the the speed booster and the strength builder that I think uh, made my life so much better and made this whole thing go by quicker. And it allowed me to get to painting these paintings that I want to paint faster than otherwise. Wow. Yeah. And that, that makes perfect sense. Even um, Even just slight discomfort, you know, that promotes growth. Um, so it's a uh, thing. Kudos, bro. Uh, just jumping at a crazy commission so early. I could understand why your hair was falling out, why you were stressed as hell, but um, <laughs> it definitely, yeah, you know, trial by fire. Here you are, like, chilling. Uh, and that's what counts. <laughs> and it's also very fun. You have to remember, like, depending on your psychology, I suppose, but I can say that for me, some of the most fun moments that I often look back on and kind of smile about are those early moments in my life where I didn't know if this art thing was going to work out and it was all by the seat of my pants. Um, and I was just kind of like grinding and hoping and sometimes the bank account would get all low and stressful. Um, and those uh, early years uh, were extremely fun because after a while, if you keep going at this, um, it gets to a point where things are like easier mm -hmm. and it is quite difficult to uh, put yourself in a stressful, challenging situation, which is partially why, oh, hey, chicken, my cat, uh, okay. which is partially why my friend and I, we started uh, going out and plein air painting because... Um, we both have a lot of experience in portrait painting. And I asked myself, well, what's the next, uh, how do I get that student mindset, uh, which is so pleasurable, honestly fun to be in when your brain is alive and learning and you can like literally feel your brain like working at its highest capacity. So we went out uh, plein air painting and learning about landscape. And now those plein air paintings, they help me in my studio paintings where I want to place a figure into a big background, like this painting that we spoke about earlier. Um, so always finding a way to challenge yourself, which becomes harder and harder uh, to do as you get comfortable with life and things. Mm -hmm. um, with pressures, you get comfortable with high prices and they don't cause pain anymore. Um, you have to, I guess, find your areas of weakness and then address those in a stressful way. For me, I know what my next stressful thing would be. It would be to give workshops and do painting demonstrations. That is so scary to me right now. There, I've only taught um, 
when I got back from Watts, one of the things that I stressed myself with was after two semesters at Watts, I got back to Montreal for six months before my next two semesters. And I taught an oil painting fundamentals class after two semesters of <laughs> taking an atelier. But luckily, the Watts Atelier was so good and so informative, and I learned so much that I actually genuinely brought a lot of new information to the table in the context of Montreal, which is a place that uh, lacks information. So I can't say that, like, if I went to New York, like, hi, I took two semesters of Watts, <laughs> can, can I teach class? That's a different uh, case. But I put myself in that situation, and I had to do uh, a demo. And that was very scary. And for me right now, my next goal is I'm kind of training right now to um, doing things that would make me be okay at giving a demo. Because once again, if I do a workshop and uh, somebody pays their money, no matter how, how it is, even if it's like a $50 Zoom workshop, I don't care, that somebody wanted to do something with me and they trusted that I'm going to deliver what I said, that is extremely, extremely scary. And what's scarier than people literally watching you paint live? So um, that's what I'm working on now. So I'm doing these daily head studies for up to an hour and a half just to get um, good at not messing up uh, the first lay-in. And I'm going to work my... Actually, I'm not taking my advice. I got uh, lazy, comfy, and uh, fat and happy. I'm I'm building up too slowly and not taking my own advice to giving a workshop. The old me would book a workshop right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the old me anymore. I'm all comfy now. So uh, don't be like me. Uh, I'm trying to acclimatize myself yeah. to it. Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, you know, over time we do get comfortable and uh, more risk averse, which is natural. But it's good that you're still considering, you know, doing something that scares you, which is a lot more than the majority of people uh, aim to do anyway in their daily lives. So, again, kudos. Uh, I think a, a workshop like led by you would be really awesome for a lot of people. So uh, definitely get on it. <laughs> well, thank you for the vote of confidence. I just... Okay. Uh... I hope you're right because uh, people travel to like I've taken workshops where you go to another continent and you get the hotel and I feel like it's a huge thing of respect. I just um, I remember I was emailing this company workshops in France about doing a workshop and I got to admit the truth when they gave me the form to fill out like what I've done that uh, teaching wise I kind of got scared and I didn't yeah. fill out the form and I didn't um, do it yeah. because I find that if somebody takes your workshop that's a massive like I'm very honored by the thought of that that's a mm -hmm. huge respect that you know buying a painting or a commission that's just money right you transfer money and it's gone and it's um, it's no big deal but a workshop means that somebody took a week or two or five days plus weekend so probably a week out of their life where they're not working on their own paintings they're getting on a plane they're uh, going to another country because nobody's going to come to canada obviously <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we're going to somewhere and uh that's such a respect thing to me that um I want that. I want to be able to do to deserve that in my life, and I'm going to work on deserving that first. So I'm excited about that. Well, I mean, I think uh, I think past you would have said you deserve it already, and you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, but I'm old now. <laughs> uh, you got this, though. You got this. Um, I think you have a lot to offer. Thank you. And I think a lot of people out there would that. definitely. Yeah, of course. I think a lot of people out there would definitely. Uh, God, they would be mind blown if, if you gave a course. So considering the, the breadth of work that you have and the amount of followers that you have, I'm sure you have fans out there who'd be like, this guy has something that I need to learn. So do it. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to work hard to make that true. Good. I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So speaking of your work, um, is there uh, any place that you prefer for people to find more of your work? 
Uh, just uh, get on my Instagram and you can say hello there. Um, I have a website, obviously, but I'm not selling any workshops or videos or anything. So I've been, um, don't worry about anything like that. Just uh, say hello on my Instagram, which is my name, Pavel Soko. Nice. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Pavel, for the amazing conversation. This was, again, inspiring. Uh, I love talking to other artists, uh, especially artists who uh, definitely do the thing that they love and they are making a living. Uh, it inspires me and, again, inspires our listeners. So thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciated talking with you. It was very fun.